so starting this weekend, groups of, of believers are going to be meeting together in each other's homes, in the church, uh, in parks, coffee shops, all over the place, uh, connecting with one another, building relationship, and, uh, and encouraging one another in their walk with the Lord. So we're excited about what that means. If, if you're interested in starting a group, it's not too late. If you want to jump in a group, I encourage you to do so. Uh, if, if for whatever reason you're not able to, to join a group, I do pray that, uh, that you would take a step in at least connecting with people, whether that looks like sharing a meal, uh, getting together for coffee, whatever that looks like. Because we, we as believers, we don't walk this life out in isolation. We walk it out in community and relationship. And, uh, and that's what we're going to be sharing about today. I'm going to go ahead and pray and then we'll, we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here. Uh, this is the reason why we, we gather. Uh, it's not to, uh, not to be entertained. It's not to put on a show. It's to draw near to you alongside brothers and sisters and to, to come and hear what you're saying and, uh, and learn more from you, uh, to enjoy your presence pray that we as your people would learn how to just simply enjoy your presence um, and that everything that we do in our lives would come out of that place of our union with you. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So a lot of times when we talk about community and life groups, we, we talk about our need to get, uh, our need to get in relationship. You need to get in community and uh, you need to, to belong. And the reason we, we usually talk about getting is because all of the introverts in the room need a little kick in the rear sometimes, okay? Because extroverts, when we start talking about community, they light up. They're like, come on, people, let's have people all the time, everywhere, I can never get enough, I just love people. I, I have some extroverts in my house and it's tiring to me. So after, after Christmas, we, like our, our little Christmas stretch, we went multiple days in other people's houses, constantly around people for, for multiple days, okay? So we get in the car and we're pulling out of our last Christmas event. And we're finally going to be entering into as much solitude as one can have, with four young children in their house, but finally getting to enter into some solitude. And I don't even have our car out of the driveway yet whenever some of my extroverted children are asking, hey, who's coming over tonight? Like, what are we gonna do? Who are we gonna hang out with today? I'm like, no one. We're not gonna see another soul for a week, okay? Uh, and so, you know, we gotta encourage our, our introverted brothers and sisters to uh, see the importance and the need for community. And today it's not gonna be about your need to get, but it's gonna be about your calling to give, your calling to share. Uh, so whereas typically our conversations around community would be on the spectrum of extrovert and introvert, our conversation today is gonna be more along the spectrum of generous and stingy, okay? Or, or maybe a nicer way to put that would be the, uh, the spenders and the savers kind of spectrum, because today we're gonna to be talking about sharing your life, sharing your life. And this comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul, speaking to the, uh, the church in Thessalonica, he said that we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. We didn't just share with you the gospel, but we shared with you our own lives. We have been experiencing growth in our church and I believe that we're gonna to continue to see more growth, but I believe that the growth that we're going to experience isn't just because of great services, okay? I love services. Uh, I love what, what God can do in this corporate gathering. I love the preaching and the, not just the preaching, but the demonstration of the gospel that happens in these, these settings, uh, but services are just a part of it. 
So I believe that the growth that we're going to be coming into as a church isn't just going to be because of services, but it's gonna be because people are sharing their lives. Because the call of Christ isn't just to share a message, but it's to share your life. He's calling us into that, inviting us into it. And sharing, people have different reactions when you talk about sharing. So one of my children came up to me this week and said, dad, are you speaking this weekend? I said, yeah. And she was really excited. She's like, oh, that's awesome. I'm gonna see if I can skip out on children's church and come and hear you share because I really wanna hear it. What are you talking about? I said, sharing. She goes, oh. (laughs) Uh, You know, maybe I'll just go ahead and stay in children's church, you know, because I'm such a good sharer. You know, I already know a lot about it. Uh, We have different reactions to sharing, okay? Depending on maybe our upbringing or maybe just our temperament. Struggling, like the sharing has been a bit of a struggle for me in my life, I am the, the firstborn, okay, of two children. And my younger sibling is five years younger than I am. So growing up, didn't really have to share a room, didn't really have to share clothes, didn't really have to share a lot of stuff. And, I, you know, I've read Genesis 3 and bad things happen when we share. That's kind of how, how I saw things, you know, like let's, like people, you can take care of yourself. I'll take care of myself kind of thing. And then I got married and my wife is one of five children, the middle one. So four of the children in that family are girls, which means she had four closets, okay? <laughs> so we get married and you know there are so many things whether it's marriage, having children, starting a new job, moving to a new town. There's so many things that you don't learn about something until you actually get into it, okay? And with marriage, there's a lot of it, okay? So, you know, I, my, my upbringing is kind of like, yeah, everybody has their own space and, uh, and, you know, personal space, solitude, that's all great for me. And then we get married And I noticed early on that I would go into a a room in our house to get some solitude and uh, my wife would be there. (laughs) And I'd think, okay, well, maybe she just needed something in the living room. No big deal. I'm fine. I can share the living room. You can have it. I'll go to the kitchen for my solitude. And then I would realize that she'd show up there pretty soon too. (laughs) And I realized I'm sharing the house with somebody. Like these little things that you think would be super obvious, it just kind of clicked with me that I'm sharing my life with somebody on a much deeper level than I anticipated. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, it went as far as to, you know, I'm going into my closet and I'm looking for my favorite shirt and I come out and I'm like, hey, Abby, uh, have you seen my favorite shirt? She's like, you mean this one? <laughs> like, what are you doing wearing my clothes? Like, those are my clothes. And, uh, you know, so I've, I've been growing in my, in my sharing, uh, but for you, maybe, maybe depending on your upbringing or, or whatever, maybe your life experiences, sharing has been something that uh, is, is a challenge for you. Maybe it's like a sharing, no big deal. Like I, I love to share everything and including my entire life on social media, um, everything, okay? There, there is such a thing as oversharing, okay? Just gonna throw that out there think about it. Um, But, you know, as a child, because sharing something that we we teach children is a good thing. You need to share, you need to share, da, 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 da. Uh, And oftentimes as a child, it's because you're just selfish. You're self-oriented. You think everything revolves around you and you had it first and you have the rights to it. But as you grow older, I've realized that, that people have many reasons why they're hesitant with sharing their life. It's not just because they're selfish, but it's also because they've been hurt. Uh, They've shared their life with somebody and it resulted in uh, in a sense of betrayal or uh, or brokenheartedness. Other times, maybe people feel like they've been taken advantage of. 
at times that they've shared that someone has overextended that generosity and even had a sense of entitlement towards others of you owe this to me. Um, Maybe that's some of the reason why people are hesitant. And then another big reason is people just don't know what they have. They, They think that they don't have anything worth sharing. Um, And we're going to look at all of these today. I want to share three truths about sharing your life. Uh, The first one is that sharing is part of your new nature in Christ. Okay, like most things in the Christian life, our understanding of it starts with an understanding of our identity in Christ. Okay, the reason why this is important is because if you're one of those people that says like, Listen, my temperament, my personality, my upbringing, my family of origin, all of these different things, uh, these are all the reasons why I stink at sharing and I, I really have no interest in it. Well, it could be good news or it could be bad news for you, okay? Depending on how you look at it. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been given a new nature, okay? Christ is living on the inside of you and your, your spirit, who you are by nature, is Christ-like. He's poured his spirit into your, your spirit. And uh, God is a giver, which means your new nature now is a giving nature. God is generous. God is a giver. Uh, Jesus shared his life with us. And 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says that we share in the divine nature. Jesus has shared his life with us. God is a giver. God is a sharer. Uh, Pastor Jacob covered this last week when he talked about uh, the interaction of Jesus with the woman at the well in John chapter four. Uh, And he said that uh, for those who drink of this water that he offers, that from them will spring uh, water. It will be a spring of water welling up. Uh, In John chapter seven, he, Jesus stood up and he said, if anyone believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So you aren't trying to become something that you aren't when it comes to being generous, being a giver and being a sharer. Okay, what we're doing is it's already been given to us in our nature. We're just in the process of maturing in it. Okay, you're not trying to achieve something that you don't already have or obtain something you don't already have. It's a process of just maturing in what Christ has already placed on the inside of you. He's placed on the inside of you, this well, this spring, this river, that's not meant to just stay on the inside of you, but is made and meant to pour out into others. Um, We see this and maybe you can look at that and you go, well, that's just Jesus. Jesus shares his life. He doesn't expect his followers to share their life. Not so, okay? Let's look at Paul. So the, the verse I read at the very beginning, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, where Paul talked about sharing his life. In the verses that preceded that, Paul talked about how he shared his life with the church. And there's, there's way more here, but I just wanna hit three, three ways that Paul shared his life real quick with the church in Thessalonica. To, so that we can look at how Paul shared his life and now learn from him on how we can share ours. First thing I wanna look at is he took a risk. He took a risk. So look at, uh, I'll start in verse one, but I'm gonna read verse one and two uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter two. Paul said, you yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit was not a failure. You know how badly we had been treated in Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. Have you ever felt beat up before? Like you you shared your life with somebody, uh, you got close to somebody and you walked out or maybe you like lent out a helping hand to share something. And after you lend out a helping hand, you have a nub in return. Uh, Like you've been been hurt, you've been betrayed. Uh, Maybe offense crept into the relationship. And now what happens a lot of times for believers is they go, if that's how, if that's what it's going, if that's what's going to happen when I share my life, then I'll solve the problem. I'm just not going to let anyone close to me again. I'm just not going to share anymore. Like if people are going to take advantage of me, okay, 
I'm, I will mitigate that risk by just never sharing again, never opening up that door. And Paul here is saying, listen, we got beat down, okay? But we got up again. I want, if I could sing, I'd, whatever that song, I don't know the title of the song, but get knocked down, but I get up again. Da, 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 da. I, don't, I don't know, that's all I got. But he's saying, man, we got, we got beat up. We suffered with this other group of people, but God gave us courage to come and take a risk and to share the gospel in our lives again. And see the, the X factor here isn't, man, we read this book, we, we took these steps and uh, like I went into some deep self-reflection here and like we, we had the willpower to do it. No, he said, we went to God and God gave us the courage to trust again. God gave us the courage to step out again. And so I would encourage anyone here, if, if that's something that is a, a hindrance for you, a barrier for you, when you think about the concept of sharing your life or just sharing anything in your life, uh, all of the previous times you've been burned, um, then we can learn from this to go to God for the courage uh, to love again. Go to God for the courage to take that risk to share your life. Um, see, there's a, there's a risk with sharing your life, but the risk of not sharing your life is greater. Second thing we see from Paul in verse four, he said, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our heart. So, Second thing is Paul sought to please God, not people. So when we think about how, how do we share our life? How do we go about doing this? Make your aim, make your purpose to please God, okay? And not people because a few things happen. One, when you make your aim to please people, you won't share your true self, but you'll only share a version of yourself that you think they wanna see. Okay? If you're just trying to make everyone else happy, everyone's gonna be happy except for you. Okay? Because you're just sharing the version of yourself that you think would, would make them happy, not what's really going on, not who you really are. Another thing that happens whenever uh, we seek to please people over pleasing God is that we will end up being burned out or overwhelmed because we will try to meet the needs of people or try to meet the expectations that people place on us that God never placed on us. Because people will place expectations on you. They'll expect things out of you that God doesn't actually expect out of you, okay? People will expect you to be their savior, to solve all their problems. Does God expect you to be the savior of the world? No. Okay, that job's already taken. And I don't think he's resigning anytime soon, all right? So one of the ways that, that we can assess whether or not uh, we're, we're aiming to please people more than God is to, to assess that. Am I more concerned about meeting the expectations that people have for me than I am the expectations that God has for me? Okay, third thing that we see uh, from, from Paul. He didn't flatter or have motive for selfish gain. Verse, verse five, never once did we try to win you with flattery as you well know. And God is our witness that we were not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. Okay, he's saying we weren't pretending, uh, we weren't putting up this front to be your friends just to get something from you just to get your money. Like, have you ever had someone come up to you and be like, throw a lot of flattery on you? Like, what are you selling? Like, I have, I have all the Pampered Chef, all the Mary Kay, all the whatever I could ever need, okay? I'm kidding, if you sell either of those, I'm just joking. And I don't think I own any Mary Kay, so there's that. Which doesn't mean you should sell it to me, okay. Uh, <laughs> But do you feel, it's like, I don't, it, I won't go into other examples lest I offend more people. Okay. But whenever someone comes up to you and flat, like you can tell that 
I don't know if you can tell the difference between flattery and just a genuine or authentic love. Uh, flattery is the language of manipulation. It's, I'm going to be buddy-buddy with you so that I can reach my objective here. And Paul said, you know, we, we didn't flatter and we didn't do anything for selfish gain. Selfish gain is kind of an oxymoron because whenever you are inwardly focused, whenever you're uh, self-oriented, uh, you don't really gain a lot in the long run. Uh, when you're self-oriented, your world actually becomes smaller and smaller. Your world shrinks. It's with an outward orientation that your world actually grows. And that brings us to our, our second truth about sharing is that growth comes through giving. Growth comes through giving. Proverbs eleven twenty four. 24. Uh, in the message, uh, it says this, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. So again, today we're, we're not approaching community and relationships from the angle of extrovert, introvert, but more so along the spectrum of generous and stingy, okay? Because we're talking about giving or the sharing of your life and the world of the generous gets larger and larger. Generosity is a core value for our church. Uh, back before it was cool, back before this was the thing that was expected, Pastor Dwayne, our, our senior founding pastor, uh, he believed that the Lord spoke to him and told him to give away all of his messages for free. And again, this was back before podcasts, back before this was the norm. Okay, this was not the norm. And what's happened as a result of that is since 1982, they've distributed almost 60 million free messages worldwide. Okay, the fruit and just that seed being sown, the result of it is how much has our church grown as a result of that generosity? And I don't mean churches in like the buildings in an organization, whatever. I mean, the church like us. How much, I, like, how much has your life grown as a result of those seeds that were sown? I didn't mean to rhyme, but it had, I can't. I was gonna throw another cheesy rhyme out there. Okay. But if you look at, uh, if you look at, the world's largest taxi service, Uber. They don't own a car, they just facilitate sharing. The, one, of the Lord, one of the world's largest accommodation services, Airbnb, they don't really own real estate, they facilitate sharing. Uh, the, the largest movement in human history was built through sharing. The, the spirit came and lit the flame of the church and then they took it and they shared it. And as a result, the largest movement in human history happened. We're going to look at the birth of that. So Acts chapter 2, I'll read verses 42 through 47. This is, this is a paragraph that is expl or describing the formation of the community of faith. This is from the NLT says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing and meals. Everyone say sharing. Yeah. Including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared. Everyone say shared. Yeah. Everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared. Everyone say shared. Yeah. The money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in, the home, met in their homes for the Lord's Supper, and come on, you guys are quick. Uh, their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The most repeated word in this passage, in the passage that describes the formation of the early faith community, the most common word in this paragraph is shared. What all did they share? And if you were to just ask me without me having to really think through this, I would have thought, man, probably signs and wonders, uh, probably teaching. My, my first guess would not have been the word share. Uh, but again, what happens when we share? Growth. Um, and what did they share? They shared meals. 
the breaking of bread. They shared everything they had. They had all things in common. They shared the money from selling their things and they shared meals again. Meals made it twice, okay? I think that's, that's saying something, okay? Meals made it twice. But this is the part when, you know, like typically the first few lines of this, people are on board. They're like, okay, they committed themselves to the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread, the fellowship, the prayers. Great, I can get on board with that. They started selling everything they had. What? What is going on here? Um, and, and this makes people uncomfortable because a lot of times when we read this, we can think, man, you know, this church, like we'll probably have 700 people here this weekend. And do I need to have like my refrigerator open to all 700 people whenever they need it? You know, it, it can kind of feel like this, this overwhelming thing. Um, so I just want to address the, that concern of being taken advantage of or, uh, people being entitled and, and things like that. Um, and I want to share a story from a life group uh, that Abby and I had. So in our life group, we had a life group for young adults, college age students, people under 30, uh, which I don't qualify for anymore. But at the time we were young. And uh, so we, we led this, this uh, life group for young adults. And we had this couple in our group who had a car that was just on its last leg. I mean, it was breaking down all the time, unreliable, and, uh, and it was a struggle for them, okay? So they, they never came to our group and said, you guys need to give me a car. Like you owe it to me. Look at what scripture says. Like they didn't try to manipulate and all that stuff. Uh, but we knew that, that their car was on the frets. So another couple in our life group saw that need and the Lord moved on their heart to give them a car, like a nice car. And I can tell you in that exchange, the people who gave it, their hearts were full of joy. Like they, they loved that they had the opportunity to do it. It wasn't something that they felt manipulated to do, obligated to do. It was truly their joy to do it. Um, and in situations like this, you come to learn the meaning of how it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. Because in that interaction, both were blessed, but I could tell the blessing for the people who were able to give it was greater. Um, and so they, they gave them that, that car and within just uh, a few weeks of them giving them Actually, the, the day they gave them the car, the couple's old car like broke down completely. They didn't know that. Both of them, yeah, they had two older cars. Both of them broke down completely. And, uh, and it was gonna be a very expensive repair. They didn't know that, they just sewed the car. Um, and then within a few weeks, like they were, anyway, that's a longer story. I won't go into all that. But the, the point in sharing that story was to see how this actually plays out real time because a lot of times we can read this and we can picture in our head it being something where uh, we need to meet the needs of everybody. And that feels overwhelming. Uh, a phrase that I've, I've heard before that's been really helpful for me with things like this is do for one what you wish you could do for all. You may not be able to do something for everyone. Uh, you may not, not be able to share your life with everyone. But what do you have that you can share and do for one what you wish you could do for all? And what happened as a result of the early church sharing? The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If you feel like your life is small, share it. If you feel like your life is shrinking, share it. If you feel like your life is without purpose or meaning, give it, share it. Uh, because growth comes through giving. There is a deep sense of meaning and purpose that comes with the giving of oneself. See, we live in a world that seeks to elevate the self above everything else, even above reality. Your self-expression is a higher value of even reality itself. Uh, if reality doesn't agree with who you think you should be, then you should just try to bend reality 
to yourself. Um, that's how high of a value our world places on the self. Um, the motto of our culture is show yourself, express yourself. The motto of the kingdom is lose yourself, give yourself, die to yourself. In the kingdom, it's if you wanna gain your life, give it away. Because only then will it start to grow. The, the third thing, third truth about sharing is that you have something worth sharing. Turn to a neighbor and tell them that. Say, you have something worth sharing. This, I think, oh yeah, and now everyone's like, prove it. <laughs> prove it, what you got? Show me your pockets. No, uh, this, is, this is one of the big hindrances, I think, for a lot of believers is that they don't know that they have something worth sharing. I wanted to show a video clip that would, that would really give you a great visual for this, but for copyright reasons, and probably to keep from offending too many people, um, I'm not gonna play it, but I will describe it, okay? So it comes from one of the great classic movies, Dumb and Dumber, <laughs> okay? If you've never seen this, you may be thinking to yourself, wow, this must be a great spiritual movie since my pastor's referencing it. It's not, okay? Don't go watch it and be like, oh, my pastor told me I need to go watch Dumb and Dumber, okay? But there's a scene from it where these two guys have been riding on this moped in Colorado in the winter. They're freezing and you may say, well, that's not a very smart thing to do. Hence the name of the movie, okay. So, They've been driving through the Rockies on this moped, freezing their tails off. The next scene is they get to camp that night and they're sitting around the fire. And one of the guys is like, I can't feel my hands. And, uh, and his buddy's like, oh, here, go ahead and take my extra gloves because my, my hands are starting to sweat. And his buddy's like, you mean to tell me you've had extra gloves this whole time? And he goes, well, yeah, we're in the Rockies. In that scene, like, as I was thinking about sharing your life, that scene came to mind because I'm like, man, how many times in my life am I sitting there with all the stuff and making sure that I'm good because I came prepared or whatever, and I'm living life with somebody who's freezing, who is in desperate need of something that I have, but I'm too focused on making sure that I am as comfortable as possible. You didn't know Dumb and Dumber could be so spiritual, did you? Uh, <laughs> No, but you have something worth sharing. The, as Pastor Jacob shared last week, the fruit in our lives isn't primarily for us. It's to be shared. You know, fruit is not the same thing as a gift. Fruit takes cultivation. If you have learned how to cultivate a sense of joy in your life, know that, know that you have that and that that's something worth sharing. Because for someone who's in despair, you may think that, oh man, everyone's just this joyful all the time. Okay, not the case. For somebody who's, who's freezing in despair, they need to lean on you for joy. You need to teach them how to cultivate that in their life. If you're someone who's cultivated the, the fruit of the spirit that is peace, there are people, trust me, especially like in, in the day and place that we live, uh, there's a lot of people that need a non-anxious presence in their life. If you learn how to cultivate the fruit of peace and you can step into somebody's life and offer a non-anxious presence and teach them how to cultivate that in their own life, that's something worth sharing. The fruit in your life isn't just for your sake. It's to be shared. The same thing with the gifts that we've been given. The gifts in your life aren't just for you. They're not just cool things to show off. Uh, they're for the purpose of serving. Do you know what gifts that you've been given? Do you know what gifts you have that God has granted you so that you can share them with those in need? Uh, like if you have the gift of encouragement, the gift of prophecy, 
the gift of leading, whether that's leading in a home and learning how to parent. Like if God has gifted you parenting, like, and you just, you have just figured it out by God's grace, because that's the only way you can, um, but you figured it out. There are people who, who need that, who need the gift that you offer. So share it. Um, and not everyone, so that, that all sounds good, but also know that not everyone's gonna want what you have to share, even if they need it, okay? And you just have to be okay with that. That's why it's sharing and not selling. I'm not gonna force it upon you. Uh, I'm gonna let you know that I have something that I'm willing to share. And if you're interested, great. I would love to sow that. If not, it's okay. It's, it's gonna be all right. I'm not, gonna, uh, I'm not going to keep the experience of extending out that invitation, becoming vulnerable and offering to share something and it gets rejected. I'm not going to make that shut me down completely and entirely because there is somebody out there who needs that and who desires it. First uh, Peter 4.10 says, each of us has received a gift. Each of us has a gift, okay? Everybody has been gifted with something and no one has been gifted with everything, okay? You may not know what that is yet, but it's a, it's a journey. It's an adventure. You get to discover those things that the Lord has gifted you in. So each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And what we do with what we have is, is a stewardship. Uh, it's a stewardship mentality. I think of, when I, when I think about what we have that's, that's worth sharing, I think of uh, the parable of the talents. You can find it in, in Matthew uh, chapter 25 where the master gives one servant five talents, one servant two talents, one servant one talent. And he comes back and finds that the one that he gave five to made five more. The guy that he gave two, two, made two more. And the guy that he gave one to went and buried it, okay? And the master didn't correct the guy, and I'm flying through the parable of, of the talents. So like, if you haven't studied this out, I encourage you to go do so, but I just have to quickly move through it. The master didn't come back and correct the guy that he only gave two for, for not making five, okay? He said, you, were, you stewarded what you had and you didn't look at the guy with five and go, man, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna make five like that guy. So I'm just not gonna do anything, okay? This is what a lot of people do with the things that they've been given. Whether it's gifts in their life, fruit in their life, they go, man, I'm not the most talented at that. Um, so I'm gonna leave it for the people who are and I'm just gonna sit on what I have. Since I can't be the best, I don't wanna become my best. And it's not so much how, it's, it's not about how much you have, it's about what you do with what you have. That's what we're, we're gonna be held accountable to. Isn't how much you have, but what you do with what you have. And I've seen people who, who have truly maximized their life and taken all that God has put in them and live it to the fullest and say, I want to go to my grave empty handed. Like I, I don't wanna have anything left in the tank. And even if they just started out with a, a two person or a two talent person, they lived that to the fullest and they gave God everything that they had. And as a result, they were more fruitful and more effective than someone that was born a five. I'm flying through that. I hope that makes sense. I'm like mixing a bunch of metaphors right now. Because if you don't know talent meant money, and now I'm talking about talents as in like your skills, you're probably so confused. Um, what you have to share may start with something simple. Like I've talked about fruit of the spirit and gifts of the spirit, and those are big things, but it may also just start with something simple, uh, like sharing your house or a meal or time or your story. Uh, in 1 Peter 4, 9, uh, Peter says this, cheerfully share your home with those, oh, cheerfully share, share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. For us in our life group, that's where we started. We shared our house, we had a house, 
So we shared it. We had time somehow. So we shared that. So every Monday, we would have these young adults, these college students into our house. And it just started with what we have, we're going to share. Um, we're going to share our coffee, share food, whatever we can. And it started there. But what we saw is from those little seeds that were sown, God brings so much fruit from it. We saw so much growth happen in the lives of those people as a result of simply sharing our home, simply sharing a coffee. Uh, and from that, God continued to do more and more. And though it started as just sharing a home, it eventually got to sharing your burdens. Galatians 6, 2, Paul says, bear one another's burdens and so therefore fulfill the law of Christ. We were living life together. We were sharing our lives, they were sharing their lives. And as a result, it enriched everything. 